scriptures. You know, there are times when you can really get... Let's see. Let's see if anybody's like me. Has anybody else in here ever gotten to the place when you're reading your Bible and then you just got bogged down and it just became like, oh, this is the chore that I have to do and I know I should be doing this and I'm doing this because I should be. Anybody else like that? Yeah, well, I'm like that. I've, it, listen, I have read, I've read this thing cover to cover more than 35 times. Okay? Been there a few times. And it can still, and even though it's exciting, this is the record that God hath given unto us, and this is the record and that eternal life is in his... That I, should, I should look up the verse, but it says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. That's somewhere in the book of 1 John. And then we don't... We either don't... We don't fall out of love with the record. We just get tired of dealing with it after a while. It becomes a work. It becomes a chore. So what I want to encourage you, today's message is entirely about encouraging you in reading your Bible. Well, how, how do you plan on doing that? I plan on reminding you that the Bible is still a story book, and it's got great stories in it. And it's got interesting people, real live people, who are this, who are the who are part of the story. Who's the main character in the Bible? Well, God is the main character. Who's the one, who's, who's the one who came and, and died for us, died in our place? Jesus. He's the main character of the story. But you know what? The Bible is filled with people. And the, and the story, the Bible is also the story of people. People who did stuff. Some of them were very, very ordinary people that you would pass on the street and would never think twice about. Other people were remarkable people who were brilliant and had education and, and, and position. But it's still, they're still in the middle of the book, which is God's book, there's still a lot of stories about people. And sometimes we got to look at that and say, I'm one of those people. I can relate to the people in this book because I'm a people too. And at the end of the day, you know, like some of us, some of us were born with a silver spoon in our mouth. Some of us were born in slightly more humble beginnings. Some of us were, some of us were, were, were encouraged into higher education. Some of us didn't get out of grade school. And it's the way, but at the end of the day, people are still people. You know, that, I don't, care, I, don't care what, I don't care what your income level is. I don't care what your educational level is. I don't care where you were born. I don't care. Listen. At the end of the whole thing, everybody gets six foot by three foot by, by, by two foot, right? Uh-huh. Doesn't matter. It's all, it always ends the same way. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, you know what I say? Rich people live just like you and me, except they do it in nicer surroundings. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> see, I like, see, I like it when I, when I get to when I get to come to a church and people are, are having fun and smiling and enjoying each other and enjoying stuff. So the stuff I want to encourage you in today is the reading of the scriptures. Now there are certain books of the Bible. When you get bogged down in your reading, when you're getting through Deuteronomy or, or, or Numbers, 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 Numbers is, I, listen, I know God put it in there. There are things in Numbers that are very important. There's things that we have to see. But, you know, most of what's in Numbers is just numb. <laughs> it makes you numb <laughs> as, you're trying to, as you're plowing your way through 30-odd chapters of genealogies and stuff. It's not easy. So every once in a while, you've got to take and say, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go read an action-adventure story. I'm going to go read Genesis. I'm going to go read about, I'm going to go into the life of Joseph. I'm going to read about that, about chasing, you know, like basically it's a race on camelback or something like that. I'm going to read about, I'm going to read about how, how Joseph has a chance to get even with his brothers, and he doesn't. And God prepares a way for the whole nation and for the whole family and for everybody. You know, sometimes you've got to do that and just get, I read, I don't know about you, I read a lot. I read my Bible. I also read novels. I also read history. I read science fiction. I read, I read all kinds of things. You know, good fiction has to be, 90, has to be more than 90% truth, by the way. So you rarely, you rarely wind up picking up a book where you do not learn something. Almost every book you'll learn something from. But there are times when you got to just get into the stories of the Bible and get involved in the lives of the people in the Bible. 
I'm trying to think the last biography. The last biography I read was uh, Alexander Hamilton. Very interesting fellow. Very interesting. Christian. No? Believer. Son of a, a grandson of a, of a slave. Interesting man. Interesting man. Crazy. Crazy time. Just marvelous. Uh, you learn things about people. You learn things about history. History is important because if you don't learn it, what do you wind up doing? Repeating it. That's why it's important. So listen, I want to talk today. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pick a guy out of the Bible who's maybe not the most ordinary guy. The Apostle Paul was not really an ordinary guy. He was just a little cut above the average man on the street. The Apostle Paul had some education. His, what do you think his field of education was? The law. He studied the feet of a doctor at the college in Jerusalem, and his name was Gamaliel, who in Acts chapter 5 warns the rest of the Sanhedrin, you know, okay, you guys want to persecute this, this, this Christian business. You want to persecute these followers of Jesus. And he gives examples of, hey, this guy died, what happened to his followers? Pfft. This guy died, what happened to his followers? Pfft. They, won't, they went away. He says, so you know what? This guy died, so let's see what happens, because you could find yourself fighting against God. Gamaliel was a brilliant brilliant man who understood things, uh, had probably had more than a passing suspicion that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And he cautioned them against, he says, don't find yourself fighting against God, boys. This, is, this, guy, this guy might be the real thing. We'll know by what happens with his followers. What happened to his followers? Oh, yeah. They were called those people that turned the world, what? Upside down. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, see, when Jesus died, it's not the end of the story. You know, when these other fellows that, that, uh, that uh, Gamaliel talked about died, the story was over. And when Jesus died, the story isn't over. And it is, isn't even over yet. What are we waiting? What, what's, what's the next big event that we're waiting for? Jesus comes. Some of us, some of us are going to get to heaven before, but uh, we're looking at Jesus coming back. We're looking at the rapture. Then we're looking at the second advent. We're, going to, we're not going to be in the tribulation, but we're going to have a view of the tribulation. We're going to have the real high view of the tribulation. We're not going to, be, not going to have the low view. We're going to have the high view, looking down instead of looking up. Amen. Say amen. amen. I mean, hey, you see that? You see that red mark on my hand? I scalded myself with a hot cup of coffee this morning. I mean, it hurt. It hurt. As, there, as, as I'm driving up here, I'm thinking, you know, just that little patch right there kind of hurts, you know? It's stinging and it's stinging and it's stinging. I'm thinking, aren't you glad you're not going to hell? Where that would go on all over your body forever. Yeah, I'm really glad I'm missing that. <laughs> missing that is going to be the high point of eternity, missing that. That's going to be, the, that's going to be yeah. I, I didn't like that. I can't even imagine what the, what, what the other one would be like. I can't even imagine so, you know, we have, we, we have certain advantages. Well, getting back to the Apostle Paul, he's a pretty unique fellow. His study is in the law. What's he, do, what's he do for a living? In that way, he's a lot like us. He's a tent maker. He works with his hands. He's a tradesman. He, and by the way, more than once in the ministry, he didn't take support and he wouldn't take an offering. Wouldn't take it. He'd be there someplace, and he knew that the people were kind of suspicious about the money. He says, forget the money. Don't give me anything. I'll work. It's one of the reasons why I have, I have only the utmost respect for pastors who are not going to take from their church, but instead take from themselves and are willing to do, to do the work without taking the pay. It's a nice tradition. The Apostle Paul was the one who started it. Yeah. I'll work my way through this one. Don't worry about the money. Because that's what, he wasn't, in the, he wasn't running what I call the American business model of church. <laughs> he was just, I decided to, since I received it freely, I'm going to give it to you freely. It's a nice thing. Is it, is it okay to pay your pastor? Totally. Is it okay for him to be full-time in the ministry? Totally. Nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. As long as it's not the most important thing in his life. It's wonderful. So the Apostle Paul is an interesting, an interesting and, and uh, probably, probably our greatest example of a Christian and what he does. 
And we know that in his, in his, the beginning of his experience with Christianity, we know that this man was a great persecutor of the church. He was a very, he, he was, matter of fact, turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, while you turn there, I want you to briefly look at chapter 1. I want you to take a peek at that. When you get to Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. When's the last time you just read through the book of Acts? Anybody in here just recently just read through the book of Acts? I don't see any hands. Okay, here's your homework. Read through the book of Acts. Why are you doing that, Brother Dan? Because I want you to go back and look at the excitement and the thrill and the amazing adventure that the church, not was, is. Paul lives this amazing, incredible life. Nothing to say that we don't have the same amazing, incredible life. We just may be doing, we're doing it in a different time, in a different place, in a different culture. But your life as a Christian is still an amazing thing. But you've stopped being amazed by it. Read the book of Acts. I, I, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to punch through a couple of chapters of it. But there's 28 of them. And we're not going to cover all 28. We're going to skip over big chunks of it because I want you to go and jump into the adventure and put yourself in the book. Read it like you're reading a comic book. How many people in here are DC? Okay. How many people are Marvel? Yeah, I was going to say. All right. Get yourself into the comic book. Have fun. I'm a Marvel guy. I'm sorry. I was DC until I was about 12, and then it was like, okay, yeah, now it's time to get into Marvel. Okay. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Quick prayer. Lord, we come here to be blessed by you and by your word. Uh, please turn up today. We need your presence. We need your touch. We need your spirit to uh, make things real to us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In, Luke, in, Luke, in Acts chapter 1, Luke, who is called the beloved physician, okay, uh, we, hear, we hear him describe that Paul, when Paul writes to the Colossians in, in, in Colossians 4.14, he calls him Luke. It says He says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He is the author of the book of Acts. He is our scribe. He's the guy who does the writing for us. And he says this. He says, all right, and I don't have it written down, so I'll just have to turn over to it, okay? Somebody read, somebody, better yet, somebody read it for me. Who's got it? Who's got Acts 1 1? Read it. Mikey. See, this is how we, we end the Gospel of Luke and we begin the book of Acts. Luke is one of the apostles, he's a disciple who follows. He is also a medical doctor, okay? So he's a man of some education, some, some means. So Luke comes and he says, listen, you've heard about, you've heard about Jesus' life. I wrote that to you in, the gospel, in my gospel, the gospel of Luke. Now I'm going to let you see what happened after. And this is where the book of Acts takes us. It takes us into this amazing adventure of what the early church is and how the Christians come to be known as the people who did what? Turned the, turned the world upside down. Now, did we do that by ourselves? No. <laughs> it's God that's doing the work, but he's doing it through what? Us. People. He's doing it through people. We are as much an instrument of God's work as the Apostle Paul. We are as much an instrument of God's work as Luke. We are as much a, an instrument of God's work as Billy Graham. We're just not as well known. We're still what we are. I came across, I was, I was in a, I was a, can I tell you a story? I was at Buffalo Cigars, enjoying a cigar. I'm watching, there's a couple of kids playing chess at the table near me. And 
I'm kind of observing people. I talk, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an outgoing person. I talk to people. It gives me a chance to, it gives me a chance to, to discuss things with them. And we may even wind up talking about God. You never know what will happen when you engage people in conversation. And so the one fellow gets up and goes back to work because he works there. And a fellow walks in, sees the chessboard, and, and he, looks at the, he looks at the young man, and he says, Oh, are you a chess player? And the kid kind of like, well, uh, uh, I said, so wait. He says, do you play chess? And he says, well, I play it, but not very well. I said, it doesn't matter. You play chess, right? What's that make you? A chess player. Do you know Jesus? Do you follow him? Do you follow him? Maybe, maybe you're like me and you don't follow him very well. Guess what? I'm still a what? I'm still a follower. I'm still a Christian. I'm still a what? I'm a disciple. And you are too. Don't lose that. Don't lose that. Just because we may do some, we may not do some things particularly well, does that change what we are? No. Don't run your don't allow the devil to convince you that you are not important. Do not let him convince you that you are not a disciple or a follower because guess what? When you got saved, you became one. Maybe we'll never be famous like Paul. Maybe we won't be famous like Billy Graham, but we will still be what? We will still be disciples. We will still be believers, whether anybody likes it or not. You are what you are, and you became what you are when you asked Jesus to save you. That changed you. That altered, that altered the eternal landscape. That changed. That changed our destination. It changed our destiny. It changed our manner of thinking and our manner of living. And it caused the way we think to change. And it caused the way we feel about things to change. We changed because Jesus changed us. Didn't do it on our own. He did it. So never run yourself down and say, I'm not as good as... The no. Stop right there. Are you a chess player? Why? Because you play chess, that's why. Are you a disciple? Why? Yes, because Jesus made you one. Don't lose sight of that. Don't, lose, don't, don't let the devil trick you into thinking you are insignificant because you are not. Don't let him fool you. Devil comes, the devil loves to play tricks with us like that. He loves to try to talk us out of the things that we are and out of the things that God says we're entitled to. We're entitled to those things. Now, I am so far off my eight pages of notes that I don't even want to think about it, but we're still going to do some stuff, okay? We did, can we do some stuff this morning? Can we have a little fun? Let's have a little fun. So, as we know, Saul, his name is Saul before he meets Jesus. And after he meets Jesus, now I want to tell you, what I want, just, just as we talk about this, uh, Saul means asked for or inquired of God. After his conversion, he becomes Paul, which means small or humble. Paul didn't see himself as this big character. Paul just saw himself as a what? He's a servant. He's a disciple. He follows Jesus and he doesn't think he's... He doesn't... Listen... As we read the Bible and a third of the New Testament is written at the hand of Paul, we think, wow, he's something special. You know the best part about Paul? He didn't think he was something special. Remember that. Don't let the devil fool you about that. We're in, we are, hey, are you a chess player? <laughs> Did you play a game of chess? Yes. Well, guess what? You're a chess player. That's what you are. Are you a disciple? Yeah. Jesus made you one. Don't lose, don't lose sight of that. Stay, stay in the game. Stay in the game. Now Saul is standing there in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen, one of the first deacons of the early church, is being martyred. He becomes Stephen the deacon at the first, church, the first Baptist church of Jerusalem. Go ahead, smile when I say that. Some people think that actually, that's what it actually was. No. There's Stephen, the deacon, one of the first deacons at the, at the first church of Jerusalem, 
And he has preached and he has caused so much disruption and caused, he's caused such religious controversy that the, that the people in the predominant religion in Jerusalem, oh, that's the Jews, right? They, they're practicing what? Judaism. They're, they say that they're worshiping the Lord of hosts, but when, when the Lord of hosts turns up in the flesh, they don't recognize him and they don't realize who he is and they crucify him, which is predestined anyhow because Jesus Somebody has to be the one sacrifice for sins, like Brother Mike was saying in Sunday school. Somebody has to be the one sacrifice for sins forever, makes one sacrifice, and it's done. And the Old Testament sacrifice of animals is done. And the veil of the temple is done. And there's no priesthood anymore. And it's done. Because when Jesus is done, he sits down at the right hand of the Father until his enemies become his footstool. One sacrifice for sins, for keeps. It has to be done. It's not. It, it, is, it, is, it, is a, it is like a knife in the heart of God the Father to sacrifice God the Son. But, he, but not only is it allowed, it is predestinated that it will be so. And it happens. And this is what Jesus does for us. And Stephen is preaching about this. And the Jews are going, they're going mad because he's, they, they're saying, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, I hate to tell you that, folks, but back when you said crucify him, crucify him, Pontius Pilate wanted to let him go, and you said, let his blood be on us and on our children. Hello, you said it, now you're paying for it. You opened your mouth where God could hear you, and now he's, he's, making, he's making you go, he's making you, he's holding you to your word. Well, anyhow, they didn't like to be reminded of that, and they went crazy. It says, if you look at Acts 7.54, and it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And think about this. Look at that last part of the verse. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. These people are beyond angry. Okay? They're beyond angry. They're just so... Uh, hey. That's what it say. They gnashed on, they, they, these people are in a state of utter madness. They're completely out of control. Verse 55, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Verse 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They couldn't stand to hear it anymore. Ah! Running after him, covering their ears so they don't have to hear him anymore. These people are absolutely out of control. And in verse 58, And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. <whistles> and when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is what they say when, when our body comes to the final resting place. It says, fall asleep. It didn't say he died. It said he what? You'll find that funny thing in the New Testament, you know, like all through the Old Testament, boy, you go to the book of Genesis and you read the genealogies and it always ends with, and he did what? And he died. And you hear it over it, and he died, 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 and the New Testament says he fell asleep. Who don't like that? Tell me, tell me you don't like that. Come on. That's exciting. He fell asleep. And then we'll find out later. The Apostle Paul write and talk about them who sleep in Jesus. You'll see that in 1 Thessalonians. But hey, I'm not going to... That's a spoiler alert, okay? I don't, give up, I don't want to give away the whole story. Let's go a little further. It says in Acts chapter 8, the story picks up with Saul again. Verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They're still hanging around Jerusalem. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. 
As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. In Jerusalem, they were allowed a certain amount of religious liberty, even though they were part of the Roman Empire. When the Jews wanted to, wanted to put the squeeze on you religiously, they did so because even though they were under a Roman governor, they kind of like looked the other way. That's how the Roman Empire got, got so big and so successful. They didn't try to take over everybody. They just tried to bring them on board and collect taxes. That's what they did. And it, that empire went on for about 800 maybe a thousand years. It's a good approach. So we're going to skip right over chapter 9, which is the story of Saul's conversion and subsequent renaming as Paul. And that happens around the year 34 AD. The church is about a year old when this happens. And he begins, even then, in chapter 9, to, to, to be endure persecution before he can even get out of the, out of the city. Now, the next few years... His journeys and his preaching, while they're significant and important, they're not what you'd call extremely hazardous. He winds up in jail, he winds up chased around, he takes a few beatings, he has a hard time. But then things get real crazy around the year 48. About, about 14 years into Paul's, Paul's time as a Christian, we get into Acts chapter 14, some crazy things begin to happen in Paul's life. Acts chapter 14 and verse 19. And Paul's been traveling. I want to tell you something about Paul. Paul has been on these missionary journeys. He's been traveling. He, has tra he makes three missionary journeys, and then he winds up taking one trip to Rome, which is what we're really trying to talk about when I get here, because the trip to Rome is the crazy time. But when he gets to Iconium, wild things begin to happen. The Jews, of course, are just mad. Well, you see how crazy the preaching of the cross was making them. Okay, And so they, they've been following Paul. You know, Paul has traveled thousands and thousands of miles. He's walked, he's ridden horses, he's been on carriages, he's been in boats. He's, done every, he's traveled every way you can travel all over the Roman Empire preaching Jesus. He's a pretty amazing guy. He's just, he's just put himself, he's made himself available. What made, Paul, what made Paul so significant? Number one, he knew all about the law, so there's no fooling him. He really knew his stuff. He made it a habit. He was a serious student of the Bible. Very serious. How do, you, how do you become a serious student of the Bible? Keep reading it. <laughs> this is not rocket science. Keep reading it. It's all it takes. Just keep reading it. because. And when you get bogged down, put down the part that's bogging you down and go somewhere where it's fun. Go have an act. Go have, hey, we're coming up on the summer season. What, what does Hollywood give us every summer? What do they give us? What kind of movies? Action movies, adventure movies. This is when you come out with the Fast and the Furious and, you know, all this crazy. This is, this is, this is action. Hmm? All the trash. All the, all, the, all the stuff that's just pure, mindless entertainment. But there's adventure in it. Your Bible is adventure. What makes Paul different than most of his contemporaries? Number one, he's a very serious, he's a serious student of the Bible. Number two, he makes himself available. Okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? It's the first thing he says. First thing he says after he gets uh, he says, says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I'm going to be available. I'm going to make myself available to you. How do you make yourself available? You ask Jesus, you say, what will you have me to do? <laughs> it's not complicated. It's really simple. It's just a matter of making yourself what? Yeah. Available. I'm not even going to... Listen, we're never going to get close to all the things that I really wanted to do today. But we're going to, but what we're going to do? We're going to, oh, oh, I want you to see this. I want you to see this in, 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 Acts, chapter, in Acts chapter 14. And verse, at verse nine, 19. And there came certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Hey, this is not something that you're likely to survive. And then verse 20, it says, Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. This is not the stone that the people of the 1960s, us old recycle hippies, are talking about. This is the stone with rocks, okay? 
All right, not weed, this is rocks. This is serious business, okay? This is where you get dead because you get, wow, that was not a high, that's a low, okay? Literally stoned to death, and it says in verse 20, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. I want you to, I want you to think, take, I want you to take a lesson from this, okay? What's the first, what's the first lesson? A couple lessons here. Number one, God is not done with you until he says he's done with you. You breathing? Everybody, everybody got respiration here? Autonomic nervous system working okay? Don't have to remind yourself to breathe? Then God's not done with you. <laughs> You're breathing? God's not done with you. Number two, these people were determined to kill Paul. They stoned him. What happened? He didn't die. Man's plans cannot override God's plans. No one can tell you that God's done with you. Ever. Number three. God may not be keeping you here just so you can have a good time. God may be keeping here because he needs you to help somebody else. Otherwise, hey, what's the point of being here? What's the point of being here? Is it just so that we can watch TV, go to football games, eat, drink, and be merry? Well, don't knock food. I mean, like, my mom started me on it when I was a little baby, and I'm still into it, okay? But there is, it's, why do you think I hang around with Janice? I, 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 Tuesday nights are so, so much fun. <laughs> Good. See? Hey, hey, Susie. I just wanted you to know, Janice gets all that helpful advice that I give you, too, in the kitchen. <laughs> See, you, have, you guys have something in common. <laughs> Listen, we got to sometimes, we have to stop and reset. What's my purpose? What's my purpose in life? To go to work? I did that for 50 years. I'm done with that now. Okay? What's my purpose in life? Raise my kids? Eh, I've already done that. They're all, they're all married and gone. They live in a nicer neighborhood than I do. What's my purpose in life? Sit around and watch TV? Oh, I enjoy it. Don't, don't get me wrong, folks. Being retired is great. I watch my Velocity channel, drink my coffee, and read my paper in the morning. Okay? It's great being retired. I wish I'd done it 10 years ago. Here's the reality. That's not the purpose for which I'm here. There are other purposes. Part of the purpose is to keep Susie happy. <laughs> Look at that! Look, look at that face she's giving me. Hey, <laughs> see, see, I, you see, folks. I'm not keeping secrets. I'm telling you, <laughs> telling you like it is. By the way, folks, that's the way. As best we can, we need to live our lives as honestly as we can. If you have nothing to, if you have nothing to hide, then you won't hide anything. And you want to do that. That's, that's the way you want to live your life. Don't live your, don't live your life keeping secrets. It's not worth it's, it. It's never productive. No, here's the reality. God's keeping us around because he has purpose. If you ever get to the place where you think, I don't have a purpose anymore. God knows I see this in my retired, in retired people all the time. I mean, like, I'm still relatively new to this retired thing, okay? But I see, there's, I mean, I read about it in the papers and I see people, what do they do? They sit. They, know, they don't travel. They don't involve themselves in things. They don't give of themselves. They don't, take the, they don't go out and, and volunteer or make things better for people or, 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 or serve in churches or do stuff. They, their life, they thought that their life, now they don't work anymore, they've lost, their, they've lost their purpose in life. Christians never lose their purpose in life. Sometimes we forget about it. Sometimes we get distracted from it. But we never lose our purpose. Our purpose is to please God. It's to serve God. It's to do those things that God would have us to do to improve. Hey, I'm on a lot of Facebook discussion groups. We talk quite often about this. Do you know what my, one, of my, one of my key sayings is as people talk about the things that have been done by churches? You know one of my key things is? Jesus needs better public relations. He needs better PR. Who's going to give it to him? 
We are. We are. We need to make Jesus look better to the world by the way we treat people. And whether we're, whether we're here, are we here to judge or are we here to help? Are we here to educate? Don't lose your purpose. Don't let, don't let the devil try to convince you that you don't have purpose. Christians, as long as we're breathing, we have purpose. There's, an amazing, there's amazing things that happen in the life of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is, is dead by the year 66. Nero, one of the, I think it's Nero winds up having him, having him, winds up having him killed. But in the 60 years that he lives, he has the most amazing impact on the world, on the known world that you can possibly imagine. Now, I really wanted to sit here and I wanted to tell you the story of, of, of I'm going to give you, I'm just going to give you a little background. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to turn it loose and, and tell you, please, go read your Bible. If you don't read anything from the book of Acts, but read what happens from in Acts chapter 27 and 28, the way Paul's last trip to Rome comes out. It's just that trip alone is amazing. I'm not going to tell you what happens prior to that. How does Paul wind up going to Rome? He gets in trouble. From Acts chapter 21 to Acts chapter 26. By the way, I'm giving, what am I giving you right now? What, I'm giving you an overview. I'm giving you a survey. I have pulled the camera back from the, from, the, from the one verse to the chapter, to the chapters, to the book. Okay? We're just looking with the, we're, doing, we're, we're taking the picture of what we call the macro lens right now. You know? So you get an idea. And by the way, folks, this is many times, this is how you have to study your Bible. The more you read your Bible, the more you study your Bible, sometimes you have to pull back and say, wait, what's here? What's on this side? What's on this side? In Acts chapter 21, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. Everybody, every single person he talks to before he goes back says, don't go back, don't go back, don't go back. They're going to persecute.